It's a pleasure to uh, have on board uh, uh, Dr. Mercedes Car Carmonas. Uh, so, you know, we, we are all different types of background we come with. Uh, we come, some, of, some of us are MDs in neurology, some are ENT, some do biomedical engineering, some PhD in neuroscience, and we have lots of these. Something which is really needed in the field and something which is really uh, missing or was missing in the field is someone who does psychology and someone who does behavioral sciences. And uh, that's exactly what Mercedes does. She is the expert in psychology. She is a psychologist. She uh, works at San Lucas Foundation for Neuroscience in Argentina. And uh, probably she's smartest of all. She has two PhDs in post-rationalist therapy, uh, one from Rosario and one from Chile. And, and with all that, uh, stage is yours, Mercedes. Thank you for the introduction. I don't hear the voice. I think there is an issue. I am Mercedes Carmona from Argentina. Thank you for the invitation. I am a clinical psychologist and I work in the private practice as a post rationalist therapist with patients who have anxiety disorders and they usually feel dizzy. This is very common. So the main idea of this talk is to be able to provide you certain information about a clinical problem that is observed in the neuroautological consultation and uh, is related to patients who have a vestibular disease but do not respond properly um, to treatment or even if they are discharged, they continue having uh, their symptoms uh, in a partial or total way. Um, Another objective um, of this talk is to identify and refer to a mental health professional, those patients who, uh, without having an organic basis, uh, I mean, vestibular studies uh, with normal results, present symptoms similar to vertigo because of their anxiety. This type of, of patients are polyconsultant. Uh, they usually spend many years visiting different uh, professionals or doctors uh, without obtaining an answer to solve their discomfort and also spending a lot of money in unnecessary medical studies. Um, all the patients uh, with dizziness that I see at my office have at least two or more, even 10 years of medical consultations and they end up uh, very frustrated. So in addition to clinical criteria or examination, this group of patients can be easily identified by administering or self-administering CIEB, which is a questionnaire that I will talk about later. So uh, the objectives uh, of this talk are to achieve a better predictive capacity in the first consultation and uh, to be able to anticipate possible difficulties during the treatment due to uh, psychological factors. To do so, uh, it is essential um, the early diagnosis of the patient with comorbid uh, anxiety. But uh, why do we talk about anxiety and not about other psychological symptoms? Well, first of all, uh, because we have to know that it has been shown in several studies that the levels of anxiety uh, experienced by patients with vestibular problems are significantly higher than those felt by other subjects with non-vestibular diseases, which are even more serious and limiting. Uh, in this research, we can see um, some results. For example, patients with vertigo reported more anxiety than patients with non-vestibular neurological deficit despite the fact that pre-morbid anxiety was similar in both groups. Vertigo patients felt more disabled than non-vertigo patients, 
irrespective of the objective restrictions caused by the disease. And uh, as we can see, the rate of depression uh, did not differ between the groups of patients. So what is uh, the relationship between vertigo and anxiety above uh, other symptoms, uh, for example, like depression? Uh, well, the, the reason for emotional disturbances in the similar dysfunction is probably the result of physiological connections between uh, the vestibular and limbic system. In the last decade, um, studies have described the vestibular system of, as a potential window to explore brain function related to consciousness, cognition, and also perception. The limbic system is central to both vestibular function and emotional processing. Emotions refer to uh, an aroused uh, state involved in intense feeling, autonomic activation, and uh, related change in behavior, which accompany many of our conscious experiences. Uh, it remains uncertain uh, whether the anxious symptoms are a reaction to the distress of living with a vestibular disease or whether they represent alterations to the neural circuitry that involves anatomical and neurochemical connections between the vestibular system and areas such as the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the infralimbic cortex. It has also been suggested that because the vestibular system plays a role in controlling autonomic functions, uh, for example, heart rate or blood pressure, uh, alteration to these autonomic functions may also trigger a range of changes in emotion and personality. In general, when a patient does not respond favorably to the medical treatment of a vestibular disease due to comorbid anxiety, uh, it doesn't matter if the anxiety appears before or after the vestibular episode, it is because um, there is a premorbid personality style which is called type C personality or based on control personality. I'm going to explain briefly this personality style in order to help you identify some psychological characteristics uh, that could hinder the result of the medical treatment of the patient with vestibular pathology. Individuals uh, with type C personality are motivated by um, somatic feelings related to intensity and processing through the limbic structures. And since they don't have uh, confidence in what will happen next, they focus on feelings as guides uh, to behavior. And in the face of unpredictable situations, anxiety and somatic arousal levels uh, increase. In other words, uh, unpredictable situations such as losing control of their own body uh, in the face of an episode of vertigo are experienced as uh, threatening and consequently present reactions of fear and panic, which are typical of a dangerous situation. So they have a, an increased hyperarousal response and it works by accelerating uh, the breathing rate, uh, hyperventilation, and the heart rate. Type C's uh, inadequate coping styles in stressful situations lead to impairment, uh, impairment of their endocrine and immune res uh, responses to stress. And in the literature, it is suggested that uh, type C's uh, is, consider, is considered a cancer prone personality. This does not mean uh, that this personality style is pathological, but uh, that it has a greater tendency than other to present emotional dysregulation in situations in which they experience a uh, loss of control. But why do they experience fear over other emotions? Well, emotions are biological states associated with the nervous system and caused by uh, neurophysiological changes. Um, emotions are created by our brain, but are based on experience. When I talk about experience, I mean the interactions we have not only with the environment, but mainly with other human beings. 
as mammals, we can survive without an attachment figure. We are the mammals that depend the longest on our caregivers. And this is a reason why we developed from an early age various strategies to preserve physical um, and emotional proximity with a caregiver. Uh, it has been proven that during childhood, uh, attachment with a caregiver or a mother starts and modifies the areas which are associated with regulation of emotions and bodily, and bodily arousal, uh, that is to say, uh, the corticolimbic and orbitofrontal circuitry. Early emotional experiences have an exceptionally strong influence on brain development, uh, shaping the architecture of the brain circuits before they are fully mature. This is why uh, I will briefly explain how this type of personality or attachment pattern is developed in the brain according to early experiences of mother and child interactions. Uh, for example, the babies or the children know the environment uh, through experimentation, but uh, they don't know in advance what is dangerous and what is not. Um, that is why they, they tend to look at their mother's face, and if the mother responds with fear, they stop experiencing and also feel fear. Uh, this is a basic mechanism of mirror neurons and is the reason why we begin to feel as threatening uh, some situations that are uh, objectively not dangerous. Uh, this is pre-verbal and uh, this mechanism is necessary for uh, human survival. And it works the same way, uh, way in adulthood. Uh, when we see someone suffering, for example, we generally feel uh, sadness. So, Every experience excites some neural circuits and leaves others alone. And neural circuits used over and over get strength, and those that are not used are uh, dropped, uh, resulting in pruning. It is well known that the most vigorous growth interconnection of neurons, pruning, and all neuronal activity occurs between one and three or four years old which is called the sensitive period or critical period of brain development. For example, during periods of mother or the caregiver and baby separation and reunion, it has been seen uh, that the endorphin level rise and fall leading to alternating uh, rushes of well-being and distress in both of them. These mother-child interactions simulate a cascade of uh, neurohumoral and neurochemical changes, such as secretion of oxytocin, prolactin, endorphin, dopamine, um, creating uh, positive feelings in them. The relationship with the caregiver during childhood involves an intricate network of visceral, motor, uh, sensory, and emotional memories. Uh, these memories are activated during adulthood, uh, during period of stress, and also regulate affect uh, later in life. In, mil, in, in 1945, René Spitz researched the impact of deprivation on child development in hospitalized infants and found links between Rasmus and the death of children who never had the opportunity to form a bond. The total absence of affection in babies leads to death. So interruption of crying, blank stares, lack of activity to the environment, uh, long periods of sleep and a total loss of appetite are actions that follow crying, agitation, hopelessness, and other developmental delay. Uh, Patricia McKinsey Grittenden, as you can see, I am with her in the photo, uh, which was taken at a conference that she gave in Chile. She's an American psychologist worldwide known for her work in the development of the attachment theory, and she created the dynamic maturational model, the DMM. In the DMM, uh, neurological maturation interaction with interacting with experience is central uh, to the self-protective strategies that individuals develop to regulate 
familiar attachments, when the relationships uh, fail to protect the child, more extreme strategies are organized to wrest some measure of safety and comfort from uh, an otherwise threatening uh, environment. It is argued that recognizing attachment strategies in patients is crucial to provide helpful treatment and to reduce the risk of inappropriate treatment. Uh, she emphasizes the organized self-protective function of attachment strategies and the advantages of uh, adaptation to dangerous circumstances rather than security. Uh, she described four types of attachment patterns. Um, I'm going to focus on explaining only the type C pattern, uh, the anxious, resistant, insecure attachment. Um, which is the one uh, we typically see in the neurotological consultation. This type of attachment is characterized by caregivers who respond to the infant's needs uh, in inconsistent ways, sometimes being ne neglectful and sometimes responsive. And these children develop an anxious and preoccupied pattern of attachment in which they are not sure when the caregiver will respond to their needs. As a coping mechanism, they develop two strategies, uh, alternating between one and the other, one of uh, proximity, uh, proximity seeking and one of uh, avoidance or indifference. And that is the reason why this type of attachment is also called uh, ambivalent attachment. So these children are never sure about uh, the caregiver's availability, and therefore they try to control their caregiver's attention. And when they manage to control it, they feel safe. And when they cannot, they feel unprotected and threatened. Those are uh, the children who make a scene, for example, in the supermarket, to get what they want and overact their feelings in contrast to those children who hide their emotions and are described as quiet children. Uh, this pattern has important consequences in adulthood, developing a type C personality based on uh, control. For example, it's funny because uh, usually when people with a type C personality call you on the phone, they usually ask, uh, where are you or what are you doing? instead of asking, how are you? Uh, this happens because they need uh, to check uh, the availability or proximity uh, of the other person. So how do we diagnose type C's during the first consultation? Well, it's very easy. We have to administer the questionnaire on the emotional impact of vertigo, uh, known as CIEV for its initials in Spanish, um, El Cuestionario del Impacto Emocional del Vertigo. This tool was developed by Sergio Carmona, who is present uh, here, Dr. Ricardo Ceballos, and the psychologist Andres Alago, who was also my teacher. They carried out a research study to provide an answer to the difficulties uh, in the evolution of a group of patients with proven vestibular disease that upon finishing appropriate treatment did not experience the improvement uh, expected by medical studies. And those are the patients who don't feel fully recovered uh, after treatment that I've mentioned at uh, the beginning of this talk. So this is a retrospective study in which they studied the course of treatment uh, for 183 patients that came to two of the three neurological centers involved in the study, uh, Instituto de Neurociencias in Buenos Aires City and Instituto de Neurociencias San Luca uh, in Rosario City, both located in Argentina, and uh, Clinica del Mareo ABC de Mexico uh, in Mexico over a period of two years from 2008 to um, 2010. 
the diagnosis of vestibular disease was the basic criteria of inclusion for this study, and the subjects were then asked um, to respond to the CF questionnaire. And after that, they have done the treatment according to their problem and to establish favorable or non-favorable evolution, patients were monitored uh, with a frequency that ranged from weekly to monthly. And finally, they determined uh, together with the patients if they considered themselves as cured or not with respect to the original symptoms. Um, this information was then correlated with the results obtained in the CIEV in the first consultation. So the, the authors assigned to each CF response zero, one, and two points for the answer, uh, answers never, sometimes, often. And in the second part of the questionnaire, where we find options A, B, and C, they assign the same score, zero for A, one uh, for B, and two points for answer C. Uh, the patients who obtained scores of 15 points or less were classified as cases in which anxiety would not be expected. And those patients with scores of 16 points or more were classified as patients with the possibility of having symptoms of pathological anxiety. This uh, represents the group at risk and are the patients who do not achieve a full recovery after treatment. Um, well, as we can see in this chart or in this table, there were 91 cases with vestibular migraine, 49 with BPPV, 20 with Meniere's disease, 8 with vestibular neuritis, and 15 patients with other diseases. Uh, one of the contribution of this research is that it involves similar levels of anxiety in easily resolved diseases such as VPPV and ones of uh, greater impact such as vestibular neuritis. So they conclude that no significant relationship was found between the different disorders and high scores on the questionnaire. In this sense, we see the need to consider subjectivity, including the patient's viewpoint on their own disease and how it has uh, affected their daily life. This information is relevant uh, to anticipate the course of the disease and the subjective experience of feeling fully recovered. Uh, this tool May, makes it possible to establish the level of emotional perturbation that the subjective experience of vertigo or dizziness provokes and the consequent changes in personal image. This is an extremely self-administered uh, questionnaire. Uh, the patient has no need to uh, be instructed. Um, it can be finished in an average of 10 minutes and is easy to analyze and adding up the score can be done in three or four minutes. So to conclude, uh, CF explains non-favorable evolution as a consequence of anxiety based on the personality of the patient. Uh, remember, is, uh, we talk about type C personality and shows a high predictive value and is a valid instrument for increasing predictive capacity uh, in clinical practice for vestibular disease in general from the initial doctor-patient contact. Uh, in the cases where the doctor observes uh, high scores on the CF uh, factor of risk, it is uh, possible to anticipate the future complications and with demonstrable foundations, include the mental health specialist uh, in, the, in the interdisciplinary team or uh, refer the patient uh, to a psychologist. Well, here we have uh, the CF questionnaire is in Spanish, um, but as you can see, the patient has to um, choose between uh, two definitions, vertigo or dizziness. Um, we have some questions here with the answer never, sometimes, often. For example, um, the first question says uh, why you were uh, 
experiencing vertigo or dizziness? Uh, did you feel that you were losing control of your body? Or for example, number three, while you were experiencing vertigo or dizziness, uh, did you feel unprotected uh, or without any help? Uh, this is the second part of the questionnaire. Uh, here we can see uh, A, B, and C answers. It's different in the second part, but uh, it's very, very uh, short. So I hope, I hope uh, this brief uh, talk is an invitation to consider mental health as a part of the patient's global health and uh, to incorporate the importance of the affective process that includes doctor-patient relation as an essential variable for the prediction of the full recovery and wellness of the patient. And also the questionnaire is not published in English and it can be a motivation uh, for you uh, to do it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Mercedes. Uh, wonderful lecture. Um, any questions from any, anybody in the panel or anyone on the list? Okay, I have a question. So, sorry, Sergio, you have a question? No, no, no. I, uh, I, I would like to say that the, the, the CIT is, is already translated into English. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's available. If somebody in the audience uh, want a copy, uh, the problem is since the they are very emotional question, it's difficult to translate into different languages. But uh, mm -hmm. there is a experience with Portuguese, uh, with the Spanish. The Spanish had different adaptations uh, according to the different culture. For example, in Peru, it's a little different than in in Argentina. Um, there is translated into Italian also. So there are, there are many experiences all over the world from the original paper published in 2010. Are there any cultural differences? You know, like, um, for example, Spanish culture is different than American culture, than Indian culture, than Asian, Japanese, or Chinese culture, right? So there, there would be a lot of... Uh, uh, so someone at some point, I'm not, of course, I'm not the expert in dementology, but someone was telling me that in Japan, they don't consider dementia as a disease, but in America, it's apparently a big deal, right? So in India, I, so you correct me if I'm wrong, but when I was growing up, I never heard of word dementia. So I, I don't know how much, uh, how much of, uh, uh, how much of cultural difference does it make in the, the way we view these, um, you know, behavioral uh, dizziness? Well, the and, definition and, and, and your scale, if you if you if you if you circulate in different countries, uh, maybe that can be something it can probe, right? Yes, uh, it's an interesting question because as mammals, this information is cross-cultural, so um, emotions occurs in all the cultures in the world and uh, if and because of that I can treat patients all over the world but there are some difference in different cultures uh, in the perception of what is a what is a disease or what it's not and this is the main difference I think uh, but emotions occurs in the brain and as everyone has a brain here <laughs> there are no big difference in in how uh, this brain development uh, occurs. Okay, great. Okay, so, thank you. May, may I say something? Ah, Jorge. Yeah, Mercedes, that was a really nice presentation. <laughs> Gracias, uh, Jorge. <laughs> so, so I can tell you something interesting. The patients in Washington, D.C. versus the patients in, in the Midwest. There is okay. a very different way of reaction to, to illness uh, and with, with vertigo too. I mean, you have the extremes in both places, but people in the Midwest are tougher. 
the, the, the impact of certain things have, they, they resisted more. They, they are more uh, uh, used to having a, a harder time. Okay. So even in one nation, you can see a difference uh, of behavior and so on. So that's there just are difference. I, I, there I are differences in behavior, but yeah. the mother-child interactions or, or the, the, the interaction with the caregiver occurs in, in all the cultures in the world. Uh, there yeah. are differences uh, in behavior, in auto-perception, uh, but not in the way of brain development. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Sam, yeah, I see that all the time in uh, U.S. military veterans, right? So I go to university and I also go to the veterans hospital. So, uh, I mean, you know, when I turn on DBS and if they have tingling, they don't complain. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you never know that you know, like the guy has paresthesia and they won't tell you and you will never know. It's, it's, it's interesting. The way people do that. I say you have some question in the, in the chat. Can you read the chat? Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's in Spanish. Uh, two questions. En promedio, ¿con qué frecuencia semanal realizan las sesiones de psicoterapia y por cuánto tiempo la mantienen? And the other question, uh, ¿qué relación hay entre las emociones y alteraciones de tipo endocrinológico? Bien, wow. ¿respondo en español uh, o en inglés? No, no, tra translate to English. Uh, one is about how often... You, do you have session with the patient and the second is relationship between emotions and um, endocrine, endocrinological changes? Uh, probably the second question is very medical. Um, perhaps you can answer the, the first one. The first one, um, I usually uh, have the patient at my office uh, once a week, but if uh, the, the treatment is accorded um, with the patient, so if the patient starts feeling better, uh, we uh, have the sessions, um, for example, in 15 days or once a month. And uh, the treatment uh, usually um, is uh, from, for example, one year or two years, uh, but you have to analyze if there is a personality disorder, um, you have a, a lot of variables to to uh, uh, decide uh, that. <laughs> Sorry about my English. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. 